Hey, good morning, Victory family. It's great to be with you this morning. And also just a warm word of welcome to all our online visitors that are joining us for this message. We're so glad that you are linking in with us today. Even though we can't meet together in big public spaces for now, it's still the Word of God that is alive and active. And it's the Word of God that's able to minister to us right where we are. And so we trust that as we hear the Word today that you'd be greatly encouraged. I want to jump straight into my message this morning by relaying a story from my childhood. One of the very first movies I watched at a cinema complex was a movie by John Carpenter called Escape from New York. Now in that movie, Kurt Russell plays the lead character by the name of Snake Plissken. If you can remember that movie, Snake Plissken, who can forget that uh, Snake Plissken character with the eye patch, you know? And it being my first experience at a movie cinema, I was so excited. I mean, I was amped out. And so my friends and I, we went down to the cinema complex at a place called Noble Park here in Belleville. And uh, we grabbed our popcorn. We bought our tickets. We filled up our soda uh, cool drinks. We bought that extra bag of jelly tots and we were ready for the movie. And we were so excited for this experience that we were about to have. And sitting in that cinema complex, the lights were on. Man, we were so excited. But at some point, the lights began to fade. And you know what it's like at the movies. Usually by the time the lights fade, your popcorn is finished, your soda, cool drink is halfway down, the jelly tots is just a distant memory. But as the lights faded, we began to watch this movie that we were so excited about. Now look, the title of the movie is called Escape from New York. But let me tell you, half an hour into that movie, I wanted to escape from the cinema complex. I was so scared. In fact, I was absolutely petrified. I remember this experience vividly because I was so scared that I wouldn't even get up to go to the bathroom. And uh, it's so, it's so uh, it vivid in my imagination this time that I went through. And I think one of the things that brought about this fear that was starting to overcome me is that I had no control when this movie was going to end. I had absolutely no control as to how it was going to end. I had no control as to what was going to happen next. Now, listen, folks, that's a movie I watched, but it's kind of similar to the experience and the times that we're living in. We don't know how the year is going to end. We don't know what lies ahead of us in the days and the months and the years that lie. We just simply don't know. And so as much as I walked into that cinema complex with a kind of a macho bravado attitude, grabbing my popcorn, getting my tickets, sitting down, listen, that macho-ness for lack of a better word, that disappeared as fear began to overcome me, as fear began to overcome me. And that's what fear does. Fear prevents you and I from being brave. In other words, fear has this crippling effect on us that prevents us from facing things. We just don't want to face things because fear tries to overcome us. Fear has this effect on us where we kind of creep back into our shells uh, instead of embracing that which lies ahead. And so today I want to share just a brief message and an encouraging word about overcoming fear. Now I know, you know, that many messages have been preached in and around this, but I still think this is particularly important because of the day and the time and the age that we live in. You know, with all that has happened this past year, over the last few months, a lot of fear has begun to make its rounds. I see how fear has tried to grip hold of me. I see fear trying to grip hold of those around me, my family and my friends. I see how fear tries to overcome people in our community. And it's in these uncertain times that we face that an atmosphere is created where fear is able to flourish. Now, let me just add that fear is never a, it's never a welcomed feeling, right? We've all experienced fear in different ways. We've all experienced fear at some point in our lives. And you know, many of the biblical characters that we see as heroes, they themselves had to contend and overcome fear. Moses, for example, was afraid um, when God told him to leave his preferred profession of shepherding to go and confront Pharaoh. I mean, those 10 leaders that, that Moses sent out to scout out the promised land, they came back and they were afraid of the giants. What about Jonah, who, who was scared to go and preach to the people in the city of Nineveh under God's instruction? In fact, he was so scared, he, he ran away. 
Gideon is another hero of the faith that had to overcome fear. In fact, when God called him to be a mighty warrior, he was so afraid he went to hide in a wine press. What about Jesus' disciples like Peter, for example? I mean, he was afraid to acknowledge, afraid to acknowledge that he knew Jesus, a man that he had spent years with. And he was so afraid that he ended up denying knowing the Son of God. And I think that in these times that you and I are living in, there is this heightened sense of fear doing its rounds. Fear of the future, fear of the present. When we look at the lawlessness happening in and around our society, perhaps a fear for your children, you know, fear of your past. Things from your past just keep hounding you and and gaining on you, just this fear of the past. What about fear for your safety? Fear of rejection, fear of abandonment, uh, fear of failure, fear of man. Some of us have fears of having to face our hurts and the fear of facing disappointment. Fear has many names. So let me stop and just say this for the moment, that fear is real. It's a real emotion that we grapple with and that we wrestle with so often in our lives. It's normal to experience fear. We, we live in a day and age where fear is around us the whole time. But like most things in your spiritual walk and mine, it's how we react to fear that is important. In other words, do we allow the fear to overcome us or do we overcome it? Uh, there's this popular worship song that I'm sure you know, uh, where we sing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I am a child of God. And the definition of the word slave is a person who is under uh, or is the property of another. A person who is subject to another. A person who is entirely under the domination of a certain influence. That's what the word fear means. And you know what the plan and the purpose of the enemy is to use fear to enslave you. He wants fear to overcome you to such a degree that you are left uh, uh, spiritually and emotionally, mentally paralyzed, unable to move forward. You know, fear in our lives, when we submit under fear, fear robs us of our true identity in Christ, that being a son and a daughter of God. And maybe perhaps I should explain this by way of illustration. Down in Cape Town, we've got a famous beach called Boulders Beach. It's a beautiful white stretch of beach, beautiful soft white sand. And at the one side, there are these huge boulders and children love playing at these boulders. And if you can just, while you're sitting, wherever you are listening, just go with me in your mind's eye and just picture you're on the beach as a child with your mom and your dad, having a fantastic time at the beach. You've had your ice creams, you've done a bit of body surfing, playing in the sand. And then your dad says, or your mom says, let's go and climb the boulders. And so off you go and you're hopping from one boulder to the next. And at some point, uh, there's a bit of a greater gap between two boulders and your dad kind of jumps across easily. He makes it across no problem. Now it's your turn. And your dad turns to you and says, come on, son, come on, daughter, it's your turn. Don't worry, come across, I believe in you. You know, immediately as a young child, fear wants to overcome you. You have these fear thoughts running through your head, thoughts of, I'm too scared. Am I gonna make it? I'm not brave enough. The leap across is too big. What happens if I fall? Meanwhile, your dad is on the other boulder with his arms stretched out to you saying, come on, you're my son, you're my daughter. I believe in you. You can do it. And while your dad's saying that to you, fear begins to rise up within you. Fear wants to overcome you. And when that happens, one of two things take place. You either stay stuck on the rock or you look back and say, it was a whole lot easier just having ice creams down on the beach, playing in the soft sand. I think for many of us, when we sit with fear in our lives, when we, when we, when we are overcome with certain fears, regardless of its name, it keeps you stuck on the rock. In other words, you, there's no forward momentum in your life. There's no forward movement. There's no progression. Alternatively, you, you look back and you kind of settle for something less. That's what fear does. And the reality for you, the reality for me when overcoming fears, you're never going to bridge that gap of fear. You're never going to get over that gap. You're never going to be able to take that leap unless you know what your dad thinks about you. 
unless you know what your dad says over you. And fear prevents you and I from being brave. But I've got good news for you this morning. As I stand here and preach, I'm just so reminded I've got good news to share with you this morning. The Word of God says that when you are born again, He puts a different spirit in you. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but He puts a different spirit in us. And I wanna read that scripture to you this morning from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 from the New King James Version. Listen to what it says. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Amplified Version says that He gives us sound judgment and personal discipline. I wanna talk to you this morning about what has God given you? What has God deposited in you already to help overcome fear? Because that which God has deposited in you, that which God has put in you already is all that you need to overcome any fear in your life. And one of the key words in that scripture I've just read out of Timothy is that he has given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. Yet he gives it. I mean, isn't that the nature of a heavenly father? So often we don't deserve it. We don't earn it. Yet he gives it. So what has God given to you? What has God deposited in you? What has God deposited and given and bestowed in your life that can help you overcome fear? Well, the first thing he says is he's given you and I a spirit of power. Now, where does this come from? Well, folks, you know it as well as I do that when Jesus died on the cross and he he gloriously arose from the dead, he spent time with his disciples and then he ascended to be with the Father. He never left you and I alone. Acts chapter one, verse eight from the Amplified Version says the following, but you will receive power and ability when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses to tell people about me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of of the earth. Now that word power, uh, when I use the word power in 2 Timothy and the word power in this uh, scripture in Acts chapter 1, it's the same Greek word dunamai or dunamis, which means um, supernatural ability. And in supernatural enabling, you're able to do something. It's possible to do something. You know, God knew that you and I would live in a world filled with challenges and difficulties and and various situations. And He knew that there would come times or at least be times in your life and in my life where fear would want to overcome us. And so He gave us this supernatural ability to overcome fear, not in your own strength, but in the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, let me explain by way of illustration. You know, I'm at the tender age of my mid 40s and I know that there are just certain things in my life right now where I'm at in terms of my age that I just cannot carry any longer. You know, in my mind, I might think I'm a strong 20 year old, but the reality for me is that there are certain weights that I cannot carry on my own. Let's say I'm moving from one part of the country to the next or from house to house, I'm, I'm moving, right? There are just certain pieces of furniture that I would be able to carry a number of years ago. But because of where I am in life, I just don't have the power within myself to pick up certain pieces of furniture. I don't have it in my own power to do that. I need the power of someone else to help me. So let's say my son Joel comes along. He's, a, he's at his teenage years and he's quite a strong young man. He comes and he says, Dad, I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you carry this weight. You know, it would be foolish of me not to tap into the power that is readily available to help me shift a certain piece of furniture. You know, if I, if I don't do that, if I don't tap into the power that is there to help me, that's available to me, I run the risk that that piece of furniture, that weight, will crush me and hurt me. And sometimes the fears that we carry in our lives, the fears that you might even be carrying right now has the potential to crush you, the potential to harm you. But I wanna tell you this morning that sometimes when I am overcome by fear, I tell you, I press into the Spirit of God. I walk up and down my house, in my office, wherever I get a moment and opportunity. I pray in the Spirit. I sing in the Spirit. I worship in the Spirit. Even at times when I don't feel like it, I read scriptures. I pray in the Spirit. I prophesy uh, over my life, over my family's life, over the church. I, I, I get into the Spirit because it is a power that is readily available to me. 
you know, if you're familiar with wrestling, for example, when you are wrestling with an opponent and uh, you feel you want to give up, what you do is they call it tapping out. So you either tap the canvas or you tap the uh, shoulder or the person that's kind of lying on top of you in that wrestling ring. And I want to tell you, folks, we are in a season where it's not a time to tap out, but a season to tap into. If you want to overcome fear that's pressing on you and it's a weight on you, that fear that tries to pin you down, it's not a season to tap out and give up. It's a season to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Word of God says that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. But not only has He given you a spirit of power, He's given you a spirit of love. That's so important. You know, when you know that you're loved, You can face anything. When you know that you're loved, fear loosens its grip on you. And very often I thought in my own walk with God, I thought that, hey, the opposite of of fear is faith. I mean, I was even taught that the opposite of fear is faith. And yes, that's true to a certain measure. You know, just have more faith in your life. But actually the opposite of fear is love. The Word of God says that perfect love casts out all fear. In fact, let me read that scripture to you from 1 John chapter 4, 18 from the Amplified Version. It says the following, there is no fear in love, dread does not exist, but perfect, complete, full-grown love drives out all fear. Man, that's so encouraging. Love casts out all fear. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39 says the following, for I am convinced and continue to be convinced beyond any doubt that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the ultimate unlimited love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's so amazing that nothing separates us from the love of God. You know, God loved us so much that He sent His Son. In fact, John chapter 3, verse 16 talks about that, that well-known scripture that we all know so well. From the Amplified, it says, For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that He even gave His one and only begotten Son, so that whoever believes and trusts in Him as Savior shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, I've got three beautiful children. Many of you that are watching have your own children. And when they were younger, even when they grow older, you know, you see your children go through things where fear wants to overcome them. They're in situations where fear tries to wrestle with them and overcome them. Now, what's your response to your child when you see them grappling with fear? When you see, when you see fear wanting to overcome them, what's your response? Do we walk up to our children and say, just have more faith? No, we never say stuff like that. What we do is we love on our children. We love them. We create that safe environment where they feel loved and encouraged. And you know what, folks? It's amidst that season of their lives where they're experiencing fear, but at the same time, they experience the love of their father or their mother. That fear, sorry, that love that they experience kind of dispels all the fear. And because the fear is now dispelled, it gives them faith and fresh hope to face whatever they need to face. That's so encouraging, you know. And some of us are sitting with fears that you're trying to kind of overcome in faith. But I want to encourage you this morning. My heart is so to encourage you that perhaps the key for your deliverance from a fear that's trying to overcome you is to experience the love of God in your life in increasing measures. And folks, that only comes with an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As you spend time with the Father, or the Father that He can love you and encourage you in that time as you're grappling with these fear things in your life. And for some of us, that's difficult because of perhaps how we grew up. For some of us, that's difficult to experience uh, that love relationship for various reasons. Sometimes our, our own love relationships are a bit distorted. You know, we live in a, in a world that is governed with conditions. And sometimes we pull that through into our relationship with God, where often worldly relationships and friendships is all based on conditional love. We kind of pull that through into our relationship with God. And so we think God loves us on condition. That's one of the ways that prevents us, or one of the things that prevents you and I from experiencing the love of God in our lives. Another thing that prevents us from experiencing His love is something like guilt and shame. You know, your past is always going to tell you that you are not worthy of receiving God's love. 
that you've got to do something to earn it. That's why we have grace. That's why it's a grace gospel because we can do nothing. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. Yet He gives it. He gives us His love. He makes it available to you and I to experience it in ever increasing measures. Sometimes it's our legalism that prevents us from experiencing the love of God. You know, and I say that because sometimes we think that our relationship with God is a set of rules, a set of do's and don'ts. And somehow in our minds, we believe that the divine love of God that He has for us is based all on our ability to uphold every kind of biblical thing in our lives. Now, folks, I know that we live our lives with values and principles. I'm not talking about compromise. What I'm talking about is sometimes we think that God is, has, has given us His Word just to correct us the whole time. But the truth is He's given us His Word so that we can be encouraged, we can be inspired, that we can learn from Him. God doesn't use His Word as a measuring stick to distribute His love. He wants to love you. And I tell you, folks, I so want to encourage you. We need to experience more of the love of God in our lives in increasing measures because perfect love casts out all fear. So not only does He give us a spirit of power, He gives us a spirit of love, but He also gives us a sound mind. Now, war is a terrible thing. Many wars and battles that have been fought across the generations have left huge devastation, much hurt and much pain. And you know what, folks? That's exactly what the enemy wants to do. He uses fear as a weapon to bring damage and destruction. But the greatest battlefield of the world sits between our two ears. It's our mind. And I just want to say this, and I want to add this, is that, you know, when Jesus Christ died on the cross and He arose victoriously, He stripped the enemy of every bit of power that the enemy had. He, he, he disarmed the enemy. He dismantled the power of the enemy. I want to read that scripture to you. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 from the Passion Translation says it so beautifully. It says, Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were His. Don't you just love that? He was not their prisoner, but they were His. I want to remind you today that in Christ Jesus, if you're born again in Christ Jesus, you are not meant to be fear's prisoner. Fear is meant to be your prisoner. And the only way that the enemy can can use fear against us is by sowing seeds in our mind. The enemy has absolutely no power over us. And his strategy has always been to sow a seed in our mind, get us to think on, on that seed, get us to focus on that seed, to dwell on the seed that he's sowing. And as you give seed attention, it's like a normal seed that you plant in the ground. As you give seed attention, it begins to grow. And so every time the enemy comes with fear thoughts, and he sows a seed in your mind and you give it attention. It's an opportunity for that seed to grow. But God says he's given us a sound mind, a mind that can think with clarity. In fact, that phrase sound mind in the Greek means to be self-controlled and self-disciplined. And, and if you look at the root of that phrase sound mind, it means to teach your mind to be sober, to teach your mind to be sober. Now, I want to use a, a bit of a dramatic illustration, uh, but you'll understand as I share this with you. When you drink too much alcohol, you're not sober. And when you're not sober, you end up making bad judgment calls. You, you can't think straight. You're not aware of what's happening around you. And in extreme cases of drunkenness, you become uh, disillusional. You, you begin to hallucinate. That's exactly what happens when you and I submit under the influence of fear. We can't think straight. We lose vision. We, we don't think with clarity. Why? Because you begin to see things that are not there. It's like driving down the road and you're under the influence and all of a sudden a lamppost appears and you hit the lamppost and you wonder where it was. Let me tell you, fear about your future creates a picture. Fear about your future creates a picture that says, hey, Look around you. Can, you. can you really trust God? 
Fear of, of rejection creates a picture that says to you, hey, nobody loves you. You're not worth loving. Nobody cares for you. Fear of failure creates another picture that says, hey, you know what? You're never going to make it. You're never going to make it. Fear from your past creates a different picture that says, hey, you'll never be able to move forward. You see, when you come under the influence of fear, when fear starts to overcome you and you don't take those seeds that are sown in your mind, you don't take those thoughts captive and you allow them to grow, it creates a picture that God never intended for you to see. God's called you and I to live victorious lives. And fear will always try and come and distort the victorious life that God wants to give you and I. God says He's given us a sound mind, a mind that you and I can renew and teach to think soberly with clarity. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 from the Amplified reads as follows. For who has known the mind and the purposes of our Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ to be guided by His thoughts and purposes. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 to 5 from the NTE translation says, The weapons we use for this fight, you see, are not merely human. They carry the power of God that can tear down fortresses. We tear down clever arguments and every proud notion that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought prisoner and make it obedient to the Messiah. You see, when you allow a seed of fear in your mind and you give it attention and it begins to grow, it wants to supersede itself above the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the work that He's done for you and what He's accomplished on the cross and our destiny and our future. And so when fear wants to dominate your life and my life, we need to respond by renewing our minds. By, by taking every thought captive. In other words, when the enemy comes to sow a seed of fear in your mind, we have to purposefully, intentionally make sure it doesn't grow. And so folks, I want to encourage you in these times that we live in, where sometimes things are just so uncertain, where there's this atmosphere for fear to flourish and grow, God says He's given you and, you and I a different spirit. He's given us not a spirit of fear, but a spirit uh, uh, of, of uh, power and love and a sound mind. So I want to encourage you today. It doesn't matter what fear you've been struggling with, wrestling with. It doesn't matter what the name of that fear is. God has given you everything that you need. He has deposited within you everything you need to overcome fears in life. And so that should give us great confidence as we move forward day by day, week by week, month by month, from one year to the next, we can take confidence in God, confidence in the word that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's de deposited within you and I a spirit of power, the Holy Spirit. He's given us his love, which we can experience in increasing measures. And he's given us a sound mind so we don't let those seeds of fear grow. Hey, I trust that that encouraged you. And I would encourage you this morning to take time and just reflect and, and commit afresh uh, to the Father your life. And also just, you know, just if, if there is a fear that you're carrying, just to lay that before the Father today. So give me the privilege to pray with you this morning. Father, we thank you that you are kind and good and gracious. Father, you say in your word that you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. That's who we are. We don't submit under fear in any way, but we come and we acknowledge today. We know that you have de deposited within us a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. And so, Father, I pray for people that are watching this message right now. I pray, Father, that if anyone is sitting with any kind of fear, doesn't matter what the name of your fear is, just give it to Jesus right now and know that He has not given you a spirit of fear, but that He has given you a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. And as the Scripture says, you know, that, um, that fear is meant to be our prisoner. We're not meant to be its prisoner. So, Father, we come this morning 
and we give every fear to you. We put our trust and our faith and our hope in you afresh for the days and the months and the seasons that lie ahead. And we thank you for um, what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. We're so glad that you were with us and we trust that you'll have a fantastic week uh, over this holiday season. Be blessed.